Hello, everyone. Since this is either a highlight, a standalone book, or the first episode in a series, I'm jumping in to remind you what the rules are for this podcast. First rule is no real people stories. That means that any details from our own lives are merely anecdotal. We do not read books about real people, and we are not reading historical fiction. The second rule is that we are basing our analyses off of how the author treats characters and what they put them through. We are not judging the accuracy of the trauma, the accuracy of any actual conditions that may be portrayed, nor the authenticity of a character's reaction to that trauma or that particular condition. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The hosts are not trained professionals, and their opinions come solely from personal experience. In this episode, we discuss fictional depictions of trauma and violence that may not be suitable for all audiences. Please take care of yourselves. Specific content warnings for each episode can be found in the show notes. Events in the media are discussed in approximate order of escalation. This episode contains spoilers. Today we are discussing Virtual Vandals, book one of the NetForce Explorers series, created by Tom Clancy and Steve Puchenik as a spin-off series from Tom Clancy's NetForce. This particular book was ghostwritten by Diane Duane. Virtual Vandals takes on class warfare, vandalism, and being held accountable for your actions, even when you think that you are above the law, and also has some very cool depictions of what virtual reality could look like someday. Hi, I'm Nicole. And I'm Robin. And this is Books That Burn. Today we are talking about Virtual Vandals by Diane Duane, which you would not know from looking at the cover because it boldly declares that it is from Tom Clancy's NetForce Explorers. But author for this particular book is Diane Duane. Let's get into our factions. We have Matt, Leaf, David, Sandy, Cece, also known as Cat, Jerry the Savage, Serge, Luke, Rob, Sean McArdle, Captain Winters, and various family members of the NetForce Explorers. For our minor character spotlight, we have a collection of people who all have stunted emotional growth due to, in this book, being rich kids who haven't had it matter whether they have emotional growth. Um, I think it goes, it's not just because they're, they're rich kids. And all, yeah, it's not, it's not just that, that's explicitly called out as a reason within the text. Yeah, so they, there's a, there's a setup here where, some of these kids are, you know, the the children of entrepreneurs or inheritances from entrepreneurship in, in the past, or diplomats, children especially, or people, or, or government officials' kids who those particular government officials have, have made bank on whatever nefarious things they do. And... Uh, specifically these, th- these kids are talk, they talk about, and in, in one particular conversation, they highlight how those parents' lives are, are more important than their children's growth and development. So yes, these kids have rich kid syndrome where, you know, when they're not taken care of, they lash out and they do not have the emotional maturity or empathy for other people and they, Physic- either physically or because a lot of this book is online, virtually hurt other people. But a, a big, big part of it here is that that, that root cause of, of just abandonment and neglect emotionally. Like these kids are fed and clothed and housed and physically cared for. But if they have problems or if they have things that they just don't know how to handle or if they have you know, situations where they need to learn how to be emotionally mature or functionally, functionally mature or, or know how to, you know, just be to empathize with, with other people. They're not given that, that upbringing. They're not given that, that, um, uh, that emotional structure from their families. Yeah. And it's, it's a very much, it's very, I think it's personally, I think it does a, this book does a really good job. There's only really one conversation where 
The characters explicitly talk about it on screen, so to speak. But it does Mm -hmm. a very good job of highlighting exactly how much that is a contributor to their behavior. And, and and how much they the things that they do to lash out stem from that that frustration of feeling like they are they are unimportant or the only thing important is that their families have money. Yeah, and this yeah. ends up applying to not just the rich kids in the antagonist group, but also one of (laughs) the rich kids who is part of the net force explorers um like Mm -hmm. he pulls like pranks to get his parents attention Um, yeah yeah this is a very much an explored thing yeah it's it's not it's not something that only the antagonists have no no and even it it does set up that i was gonna say even to the point that like the main behind the scenes antagonist isn't even one of the rich kids. Like no. that's how much it didn't do this divide is that it actively negates <laughs> that. Yeah. Which it would have been a very, very easy way to set up a bunch of villains. Yes. Um, yeah. It didn't do that. And and Leaf actually, who is our our rich protagonist, there's a little bit of conversation that there with him and Matt talking about that and, and he kind of it kind of explicitly a little bit too kind of draws that line of basically saying like this could be me except and then he almost like he almost says like this could be me except that i try to make sure my my pranks don't actually hurt people (laughs) or like you know this could be me except that i i don't want to hang out with those people because they're all shallow and i know that i i am that way too but even in that conversation, there's a bit of an old, there's an old money nouveau riche divide where part yes. of why he can't get in with them is because he isn't rich enough in the yeah. right way. Or, yeah, or like he has enough numbers wise, but it's because his fam- his immediate family made that money, not like his great great grandparents, and so it doesn't count. And like there's, there's this really. It, it just it does a very good job of kind of pulling that out of context and saying, "Hey, part of this is not just like part of, there's there's a very real thing where uh the more money you have, the less you have to participate in society, so to speak, the less you meet and see and talk to and hang out with people who are who are not of your like if you have that amount of money, you don't really hang out with people who actually have like problems and struggles that your money could fix or that you don't have because you have this resource. So when you have those problems, you fix it with money or those problems never occur. Just never appear. Yeah. And there's very much a, an empathy disconnect. Um, but also it is true that like, this is not just for, for rich families, but it is also kind of a thing where, you know, if your family is is more well off and the parents are super focused on that thing instead of on their children, those children are very are are more often just you know neglected or their emotional well being is handed off to other people. Right. And this book does or just and- does a really good job of kind of pulling that out of context and saying, "Hey, this happens to these kids." And Robin's right. It doesn't just happen to our 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 main villain, so to speak. It's also it's also one of our one of our our good guys. Yeah, I did think it was interesting that Luke is in an, is a in a strange position because he's not rich enough for the rich kids, but he's too rich nope, for not the Luke. poor kids. Hmm? My apologies, Leaf. Leaf is too rich for the rich is too I think it's rich Leif. for like Leif Erickson. Leif? Oh, okay. Um all right, Leif is uh too rich to have the same problems as his friends, but not rich enough to be in with the rich kids. Yeah. And so it makes him an interesting bridge character because it seems like he's got a lot of cognitive dissonance because he's like, well, I can see how these maybe could be problems, but it isn't a problem for me. And also, yeah, I, I know you maybe don't think this is a problem, but I promise you it's a problem that I 
don't have the right kind of lots of money. And if you don't well, have I... lots of money, someone complaining about not having the right kind of lots of money can come off very badly. Now, this this book doesn't have that be a source of tension between them, but I... I... Well, I also, the conversation isn't really that. Yeah. It's it's Luke... Uh, not Luke. Now, now, I'm, now I'm saying Leif. Luke. Uh, Leif doesn't... So I would actually argue that Leif doesn't have a cognitive dissonance there. Because in that conversation, he is pretty explicit with saying, like, like this is a problem in their eyes. Okay. There's, there's no point in that conversation where Leif says, this is a problem for me. Only just that... Because Matt originally goes to him and says, basically, hey you have money, can you get me in with the other people who have money? And Leif is in this conversation trying to explain to him, like, like, I can tell you how to, yeah, like, basically saying, like, from your perspective, my family has money, but from their perspective, I don't count anyway. Um, but also, he gives him kind of, like, like, his tips and, and his virtual physical avatar that his, is his in into the group. Um, and so yeah. he kind of does kind of pass along like his own tips and tricks for basically surviving that world, so to speak. But, but there's yeah. no, there's no point where that character says, this is a real problem and you don't know because you're poor. Like, no, he's very, he's very, very clear about that distinction between like that perceived level of an issue and how much like, like people are going to see it differently because they care about those different things. Um, now yeah. it's it's not framed as in that conversation. It's not framed as rich people are villainous because they don't understand real problems. Like that's not what the conversation is. The conversation is just they have different rules, so I can't just give you like a ticket to like function in this world because I don't even have one. It's it's actually very very nuanced and very very well done, especially for being such a short conversation. Like the wording choice in these conversations are so precise, which, I don't know. It, it, I think it just does a good job with that, especially for so conversations being really short. Part of why I'm getting mixed up is I cannot remember who Luke, Luke is. Luke the frog man, the Frenchman. Oh, oh, yeah. The guy who's the avatar, who is a giant frog and then transforms into a rapierman because he was okay. a swordsman. That's who Luke is. So earlier, before we recorded, when I asked about Leaf, and you said, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because you asked if Leaf was there, and I was like, no. And then I got Luf Luke and Leaf mixed up, and anyway, we're we're good now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because Leif, Leif, has, Leif has neurological damage from right. that crash, and can't be part of the right. investigation. Which actually is the, like in character reason for why Matt is the one going after this and not the person who's already in like the scene. Right, because he can't go in. Okay. Because Leif physically can't like go online. <laughs> like Yeah. Yeah. Before we leave this, one one yes. thing is that a uh, definitely a message in this book is that being emotionally mishandled by their parents is not an excuse for all the bad stuff that this group is doing. Like the yeah. book, it, it both doesn't make them a pr doesn't make them villains just because of that, which would have been very easy to do. And it but and it also makes sure to say, "Hey, no, this is still a problem. This is bad. This doesn't make them." Yeah, <laughs> like just because you have problems doesn't mean you get to take them out on everybody else because you're mad. Like that's like, I don't not I don't that's not an excuse for your behavior here. Like, I don't know if the phrase hurt people, hurt people was around in the late 90s when this was written, but if it, and I, get, I don't think it was, but if it had been, that is the message of this book. That is one <laughs> of the messages of this book. Yeah. Yeah. And also, hurt people who have the money to hurt people without repercussions will use that money to do so. I think is oh, another, absolutely. another message there. Definitely. Yeah. But, but then again, you know, kind of like you mentioned before, uh, like we do have an example of a character who is literally dirt poor and living in a d in kind of a dump, almost. Even. Do we know that from this book? I know you know more because you've read more of the books. Uh, no, he doesn't appear in any of the books, but they literally take them to the dump site and they have like jury rigged like old oh. storage containers for their hideout. Like they're not living in a house. Oh, Rob. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. But also okay. he was yeah. canonically um, poor and failing out of school and having struggles before he left. Right. And he is the main, he is the, the power behind the power, so to speak. So, like, it's it's definitely not a, it's not a book where it's, like, money bad, <laughs> necessarily. Yeah. But it, it but it also talks about those 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 nuances and those 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 mitigating factors and how people are treated and I kind of wonder how much of this is also the age of the protagonists or and and antagonists like it doesn't go into it cuz they're all potentially on the same we are still in our teens and that part of our brains isn't developed yet point. Uh, but even even in comparison to the other kids, these kids don't have the emotional well, they I I would I don't know I mean maybe the risk taking like oh, sure yeah. we'll use your program and do we don't know what it does, but sure whatever. Like that might definitely be part of it. But as far as like the the actual vandalism and the actual like disregard for other people i don't think really has anything to do with that okay like but yeah but the the risk taking behavior yeah i i would that would make sense that because they're like freshman sophomore and somewhere in high school somewhere in there yeah sure like the risk taking behavior could be part of it for international listeners freshman sophomore is shorthand for probably 15 to 17 years old Somewhere in there ish. Well, freshman yeah. sophomore would be fourteen to sixteen, but sorry, fourteen to sixteen, yeah. Yeah. But but they're they're solidly in high school and not graduating anytime soon. Yeah. Moving on to threats of physical harm. So we have two pretty distinct separate things here um actually i want to talk about our one that we labeled second first but you did, you had me put it second okay no no no. all right <laughs> one of the main premise uh oh oh in the subheading okay yeah in the uh, subheading so i want to talk about the actual irl one before we talk about the virtual absolutely one. okay so so with matt cc luke and serge are threatened with death and they get actually kidnapped. Um, and and Jerry, for the record, does actually die off screen. Yeah. So Jerry, yeah. Also, Jerry is uh, murdered uh, with a car. He is run over, and we don't get. I don't remember if we get a whole lot more detail than that. Uh, in ter- like we get like the emotional. Mm-hmm. Oh no, he's dead. I think that's all we get. This I think we just get. Like, there's no descriptions. No. It's just he was hit with a car and killed. Yeah, that's um, it. And it, in the text, the fact that he has been murdered off screen, f- to me, seems to function mostly to make Matt see, see Luke and Serge take their kidnapping seriously. Um, like, it, that's not the only thing it's doing. That seems like a main thing that it was doing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Say plot-wise, it definitely serves that for that function. Tactically, though, uh, him being gotten rid of was very much a get rid of the person who is physically mm-hmm. likely to fight back in real life with yeah, even without a weapon. Like there's there's a lot of there's a lot of big bad plot tactical pressure reasons that he was the person killed and also that someone was killed like there's some very functional like villain reasons that it happened sure but as far as like main character concerns it it definitely is a push to get him to 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 hook up with yeah and when we're focusing on the way trauma is handled with the characters Mm -hmm. we're talking about not as much on the right yeah Yeah. matt's because even because it has an emotional impact on Matt, even though he is not Jerry's friend, so mm-hmm. like CC Luke and Serge are dealing with their compatriot, and I don't know to what degree friend, but at minimum, like, mm-hmm. um, oh, I, I mean, I would say they're friends. Be- they're, they're friends because the I whole f- 
Cece, Cece recruited her friends to go have fun trashing virtual spaces in the first place. Oh, okay. Like, this was not yeah, a so- go find expendable people. This was go get people you like and trust. And she was like, these guys. Like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah I, they're friends. I wasn't sure if they're it was- They're solidly ex- if it, I wasn't sure if it was expendables or friend group. So- so, like, they all are upset that their friend is dead, but Matt is also upset because if this person is willing to murder and then kind of brag <laughs> about it, yeah. then that that means he's more likely to maybe kill one of them and it could be Matt. So it it, it definitely ups the danger level, but it, it ups the danger level, but to me, while also treating jerry as literally disposable in terms of the plot it was like it, yeah yeah you can die off screen like i don't know if i yeah. would have wanted a gory scene where one of them sees him getting hit by a car like i don't that would have been out of that would have been out of tone i think with the rest of the book for that to happen yeah this is this is very much a upper elementary lower middle schooler story yeah like that would have been but that would have been a lot um to do yeah especially but like also, you're saying like it, it would have been very out of tone there there are books that have like we've reviewed animorphs before like there's books that that have that but they're like that all the time right and but but jerry getting fridged like this uh, <laughs> just yeah just like oh and by the way jerry's dead Oh, I will say this. Jerry, not Cece. This is true. This is true. From a trope perspective, much better. From a tr- <laughs> from a trope perspective, yeah, killing off the only female character with- Kill- Killing off not the only female yeah. villain. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, killing off the only female character with more than four lines would have been bad. Um, I'm glad that didn't happen, but even that I- Even that- I care more about the trope of which one of them died uh, versus the actual character. Like, to me, I didn't... I mean, you're not supposed to like Jerry. Ah, uh, right. He's literally, Matt- a vo- he's literally a punch you in the face because I have anger issues and I have the money to make it so that I won't get put in jail. Villain. Villain, yeah. Like, you're not gonna care. Like, if he... He's not built up to be empathetic. <laughs> Like, he's not even, like, no. mustache, he's not even mustache twirling no. interesting. He just, he's, he's punchy threat guy. Yeah, he, yeah. Um, <laughs> like, like, tactically, as far as, uh, Luke is, or not Luke, uh, tactically as far, now, I'm calling everyone Luke now that you've called Leif Luke. Uh, <laughs> tactically, as far as Sean is, as, uh, Sean is concerned, um, no, not Sean, as far as Rob is concerned. He is the 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 physical threat that they would need, and and also he's the least likely to be cowed by like one of his compatriots dying. Demonstrably, his I mean his in canon in book in universe nickname is the Savage because when he gets mad he beats up people because he knows yeah. he won't get in trouble for it. Like he's not the character that you're gonna find out he's died and gone. Oh no, my heartstrings. Like no. <laughs> He's he's set up to be unlikable. I do feel I do feel like having his name be Jerry Savage and having his nickname be the Savage was a little on the nose from the author, but okay. I feel like the nickname came out of the out of the oh oh, oh. from the author yeah right from the author like <laughs> yeah if you've got this if you've got your friend who punches people and their nickname in their last name literally is Savage of course you're gonna that makes sense. <laughs> Um, yeah. but have, but naming him Savage and then having his nickname be The Savage is a little <laughs> on the nose. Um, that, that's like, <laughs> we did have, that's like, that's like, that's like, um, having one named Mike the Murderer. What's his last name? Oh, it's Death. What? what? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, we do have another kind, uh, harm physical harm threat of physical harm in a very interesting way um one of the main premises for this book is that virtual physical harm so getting punched or shot in the virtual in vr is now able to cause real brain damage because your brain the explanation was that your your brain thinks you got hurt and isn't able to Part of it is that it's not able to reconcile yeah. being hurt and not being hurt, and so it just thinks you're hurt and it freaks out and shuts down in different ways. Yeah. Um, 
But isn't there also something? Oh, later on, there's there's later on there's we'll, we'll talk more about the neurological damage. But yeah, it it means that it means that Jerry's able to punch people in the real world and in the virtual <laughs> and in world. the virtual space. And, yeah, yeah, so you can punch people all the time. Um, <laughs> Like we're introduced to these villains with them uh have doing a, a massacre in a virtual ballpark. Yeah. Um and it went from maybe you can have a bad thing with your connection or th- there's ways to have something go wrong where connecting to VR can hurt you, but it went from an occupational hazard to a weapon that someone is wielding against random people who were at a virtual ballpark to watch a virtual game. (music) Moving on to neurological damage. You had a lot of things about this one. I have a lot of thoughts on this one. Yeah, so kind of coming out of our second topic, for anyone who skipped that one, the... So a lot of this book's premise is based on VR being how the kind of almost the default internet, like there are non-VR, but still online options that people still utilize day to day. But the vast majority of the things that are on screen, um, so to speak, are are in this virtual reality where you as an internet user are actually plugged into an interface and you're in VR, but your brain is in VR, not just you seeing it with your eyes. Uh, which, which is, you know, when we, so when we say VR, we don't mean that things are in 3D and we don't mean that things are just like, you just have glasses on that let you pretend that things are in 3D. Like, like in this in this series, you actually plug in, so to speak, into the matrix, and so when you're physically there, you can do things like pick up the uh, the Google search icon, which is not an example from the book, but it's a you know pulling from a real world example. You would like pick up your search engine or pick up your your podcast recording app or whatever, but you would you would physically touch it, physically handle things. Uh, people feel pressure on their fingers. You feel a tug as you're being pulled through to a destination on the internet. You physically grab icons and you can touch them and move them with your hands in a very tactile, very sensory way. But there are also uh, limits to this and buffers and um, programming and functional uh, I would even go as far as to say hardware and software on your hardware. Not just virtual programming, but like functional safety protocols that kind of filter. So like you can physically touch and physically pick up your your Internet Explorer, so to speak. But if you get punched in the face, you don't get hurt. That's how this world is kind of set up. The thing that happens in this book, the big problem, is that the the main antagonists have some kind of programming that allows them to override those security protocols. So when you get punched in the face, your brain actually does think you got punched in the face and the nerves in your head react to reflect that. You don't actually come away with like, like physical body damage. Like you don't, you know, like you're you not going to get random bruised. bruising. Yeah, exactly. But your brain is functioning as though you have been, you've taken that injury. And so, uh, in the beginning of a book, when we have people that are shot in virtual space with virtual bullets that do real physical dam- impact damage, we actually have people going into shock because their brain thinks that they've been shot. And that's kind of the big, like the big shift here in, in this story, which is a scary thing because, you know, if you if you're supposed to have security protocols that keep you relatively mostly safe most of the time, at least safe from intentional impactful damage, suddenly finding out by virtue of getting, you know, shot by a cartoon bullet that you can, you can end up with like real world consequences. That's terrifying. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that half of this before we go on to the other one? Um, I know, I know this is a section that like you, I know this is mostly my opinions. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't have this. So the, the one thing is if you, if you go to read this and you start with just this, 
because so 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 within the world of the story it is a new thing that people are able to do this but from my perspective on page two people are able to do this and then they're able to do this for the rest of the book and so for (laughs) me not already having read any other net force books not having read anything else by tom clancy before this um, and even uh, technically Tom Clancy didn't write this, but not having read anything in that zone previously, I didn't experience, we have a paradigm shift. Why can they do this? They never could do this before, <sighs> which you're clearly meant to feel. I mean, and it didn't at least yeah. a little bit, but like for me, it was like, oh, cool. This is the state of technology on page one <laughs> and two. Excellent. Um, I mean, I feel like this it- makes. Actually, I actually didn't does, feel like the book convey... was setting it up for you to be shocked. I felt like the book was. Yeah. I felt like the book was using this to kind of tell you what the technology was like, so that you know right away that you're supposed to physically touch things, but it's not supposed to hurt you. Like that was that was how I read it, even back when I first read the series. It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> like you're here and, and you're physically here, except you weren't supposed to get hurt. Like you know. Cause, cause then it makes, it makes like the, the, the descriptions later in the book of like feeling a physical tug when you grab something or holding someone by the hand or like it, it makes those physical sensations suddenly something that you're already thinking about as a reader instead of it just right. kind of happening. I don't know. <laughs> that was my yeah read on it. But just, you know, if you experience it as a paradigm shift, cause you've, you're already familiar with the world before this change. Cool. If like me, you, you didn't, and this is just where we are. This is where we are. It does a pretty good job of conveying it. Um, yeah, it, it. I did want to mention that, because it gets, to me, it felt like it was trying to say, oh no, this has never been a problem before, and I'm like, this has always been a problem from my perspective, but okay, cool, we only have <laughs> one page where it wasn't a problem yet. It's fine. Okay, we're here now. So, yeah, makes sense. Um, so the other, the other part of this too is kind of just, uh, the main character experiences this once, but it's also just kind of thrown in as like an, oh yeah, that's an occupational hazard. Like, yeah, we, you know, this is a problem, but I have ways to deal with it. Is that when you have a system crash, the, it's kind of described as almost the, like the VR equivalent of a blue screen for your device. Except it's yeah. not that your, like, system VR chair crashes. Like, that's not what's happening. But, like, if the virtual space that you are virtually physically occupying crashes, you get kicked off the net. You don't get bounced somewhere else. And it, it gives you... Like, I think they even talk about this when, when Leif has his princess... Our senior assistant editor is yelling in the hallway. What do you want? She has many opinions about this text. She does. She's a lot of she's a lot of virtual reality opinions. Princess. I <laughs> just I don't know if she's loud enough to get picked up on the mic. Hi, honey. I heard it a little bit. I don't hear any anymore. Yeah, it's because um, she's n- <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Because she's not um, meowing. No, she's not meowing. She's right next to me. So to to this me This is a thing this is a thing that it's kind of treated as like a it's not supposed to happen because the systems aren't supposed to crash. The servers aren't supposed to crash. Um, and it's treated as like something that like actually does injure you uh, because when Matt has mm-hmm. it happen to him, he talks about like needing to not go online while he still has this one particular headache because he knows if it- he goes back online and it cr- something crashes again, it'll actually hurt him longer. And it, like it's it's treated as almost in the text, it's almost treated as a mild version of of the shock that Leif goes through that makes him unable to be online for a while. So I, I have an analogy. Yes. I think this analogy works. So it would be like if bikes are a thing and crashing your bike on something is rare but not impossible. It does happen and it sucks, but it's not, it's, you need to not bike again immediately afterwards, but <laughs> it, you'll be okay yeah. Like, unless something super weird happens, you will be fine. And all of a sudden, someone has cars and they are hitting bikes. <laughs> and that is the change that has happened in this book. That 
that yeah that's a pretty good that's a pretty good um yeah so like we know what to do if someone crashes their bike and so when someone's bike gets hit by a car he does the things to get leaf taken care of yeah like he had just crashed the bike but but crashed it into a moving object instead of just on the road or whatever yeah, it's it's yeah. very different. Yeah, so that makes I sense. think I feel like that's a pretty good analogy. So like we knew something that's a lesser a bit like this could happen, but this is worse and scarier. Yeah. Everybody is wearing right. a helmet. Everyone is wearing a helmet. Everyone has knee pads, pads on. If you crash and you end up like road rashing your side, you know, that knee pads won't protect you, but like you're probably probably will be oh, fine. I meant bicycle, but if you get hit by yeah. a car, Oh yeah, no, yeah, I do yeah. mean but bicycle. It'll, it'll be a pro- I also mean bicycle. Okay. Nobody wears a knee Sorry, nobody wears it. knee pads to go on a motorcycle, Rob. No one wears knee pads to go on a bicycle. What are you talking about? Anyway. Bicycles are the only place however, you wear knee pads. No, I'm just kidding. You've just yeah, you've I've just never. been doing roller derby for too long. <laughs> uh, you've so adjusted anyway, your reality. Regardless of regardless of the details of knee pads or not, uh I feel like in general that analogy works pretty well. Like, those safety pro- protocols are your helmet and, and pads. Except, if you get hit by a car, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> are you constantly struggling with how to function in society? Do you need someone to make you laugh on occasion? Are you wanting to share your thoughts and opinions? Well... Have I got a show for you. My name is Garrett, host of Garrett Talks to Himself, a segmented interactive podcast where I do all of these things. Head to anchor.fm slash gtth to subscribe wherever you listen. I'll be waiting. This month, we'd like to welcome our new supporter on Patreon, Alex Cintron. Thank you so much for supporting the show, and if you would like to join Alex in keeping the show going, you can check us out on patreon.com slash books that burn. Thank you. Okay. For the wrap-up and ratings, for our gratuity rating, for stunted emotional growth. So... There's the actual trauma, and then there's how everyone's behaving because they have that trauma. Yeah. So I'm not sure how we want to split this. Um, the actual trauma... We basically don't have. If people talking about it. Yeah, well, I mean... Um, It's a difficult trauma to actually depict in the book. Um, we ran into... Yeah, especially because our, our people with that trauma are not the ones on... Like, like, they're not our point of view characters point of view and we only so, ever see them for- in virtual spaces mostly like so i would say the stunted emotional growth is by definition backstory yeah um and then and i think that's where we need to leave it because the other stuff that we could talk about is covered by our other two topics yes um i would agree for threat of physical harm, that is <sighs> off screen. Off screen. No, and it's 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 not off screen. Well, uh, uh, that's why the and there's a major major thing that is off screen. Okay, and yeah. And there's a bunch of moderate to severe. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it's 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 definitely. We'll get into this with our how much care it's taken, but um, it's not graphic. But it's still it's mm-hmm. still definitely severe traumas, multiple traumas. I, I would go as far as to say I don't think there actually is any of this that's moderate. I think it's off screen okay. and severe. And the thing that is off screen is off screen because if it were on screen, it would be super it would graphic. Make this not appropriate for middle schoolers anymore. Well, it would it would change or let it would make it a very different. Sh- it, would it would make it a very different category. book. <laughs> yeah. Like you could still give it to a middle schooler, but yeah, yeah, it would it would make this much less lighthearted. Um, yeah, um, neurological damage. I I think I actually think this is mild. I don't think it's mild. Well, okay, maybe moderate. Like 
I, I'm actually su- you're the one who who has so, had a, con- a concussion experience, right? And you he's think this fine. is mild? <laughs> he is fine after a couple of days. No, he's not. Wait, Leaf? He's not fine. No, he's not even fine by the end of the book. Oh, never mind. If he's not fine by the end of the book, oh yeah, this is moderate to severe. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, no, he he has he has. Not the same rest- He actually has very similar restrictions to what you did after your concussion. No screens, low lights. Okay. Uh, if that's what he has, then yeah. Yeah. I probably uh, didn't pay a lot of attention to that because I didn't want to think about it because my <laughs> concussion sucked. <laughs> uh. Yeah, no, this is, this is like, this is like not concussion from, from like blunt force trauma, but this is. Like it's not literally a concussion. No, it's, it's a, a it's a it's damage. a similar neurological reaction to having a concussion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it um, reads as though that was the reference point for how how this character had to it. had to recoup. Yeah. Sorry, I read another book recently <laughs> that said someone other than everything's fine. You just had a concussion. You'll be cool in a couple of days. And I'm like, no, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> Like, no! <laughs> That's not how this works! <laughs> yeah, no, this, this, this one is definitely, this one is like, I'm, I'm actually pretty sure, I don't, I, I don't remember, I, it's been a while since I've read book two. I Dealing think he, I think he's still, I think this character still is, is like healing, or they talk about okay. how long it took him to heal in book two, I'm pretty sure. Like, this is a thing. He's so not fine in a couple days. Severe. I think, okay. I think it's, I think because of our two depi- depictions, I think it ranges from moderate to severe. Then is the trauma integral to the plot? Yep. Yes, the stunted emotional growth is. Integral oh my god! To the plot. I almost just wrote yes because I was typing That's- as you said yes. Yeah, it's <laughs> integral. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely integral. Threats of physical harm is also, also integral. integral. Yeah, all of these are integral. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah, really, so much of the premise is bound up in the combination of these Mm -hmm. three things that if you tweaked very much, it would be a different Mm -hmm. story. It could still fit in this world, but it would be a very different book. Um, Depending on what you changed. (laughs) Well, to be fair, there's a lot of books in this world. (laughs) So you could totally swap some things out and still have it function in the world. But yeah, yeah, all of these are are definitely very um very very integral to the plot yeah uh for treated with care um for the emotional growth i i think yes the discussion of it was very blunt that's true Um, so i do want to say the discussion was very blunt and I don't feel like they were trying to take care. I I almost feel like no. I think you're right. Like I think that was I th- a. I think it was just no care. A, here we only have like a page because this book is tiny. We only have like a page for this discussion, but we need to have this class discussion. <laughs> I think it was no care, Oof. but because it ranges, be- it is backstory. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so you're getting an info dump of backstory to be like, here is why I'm the way I am. And <laughs> if, yeah. if if it's particularly resonant for you, there's no shield. There's nothing separating that. Mm-hmm. So That's true. it's either just some character description or it's gonna it's gonna be like i'm in this and i don't i'm in this photo and i don't like it um (laughs) (laughs) i'm in this photo but it's a good thing that i only glimpsed glimpsed uh glimpsed the photo out of the corner of my eye because this was a 10 second discussion and moving on (laughs) like yeah and and having having trauma that big treated like handled in an info dump Mm -hmm. that's no that's not care oh yeah that's fair like you don't don't info dump that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Well, if you do, it's it's not fair. Yeah. No, that's fair. So anyway, moving on to threat of physical harm. Um, I'd say either either what 
You cut out for Thank a Oh, okay. No, I was just saying. I thought Discord cut out for a second. Uh, no. I, it's like, I don't want to say enough care. Because I'm having trouble telling. Because it's I, not... Uh, there, are, there are more graphic books... But it doesn't feel like like once it had the once it had the severity level, mm. it didn't feel like it was pulling punches it, from it, there in a literal way. <laughs> I yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, it had that severity level almost the entire time, just with different characters being the threat. Yeah, like you, you almost this is an omnipresent element in the book you never get to escape this you almost never get a break from it that's true and when you get a break it's talking about the next time you're going to have to deal with let's, it let's let's i would i would argue um, that 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 makes it not enough because it's not treated with no care there are yeah. definitely ways that this could have been much more graphic much more in your face much more just Mm -hmm. difficult to handle every everything tends to be i don't feel like care was in mind at all well but but the way it reads everything I, is a single one sure. sentence description that is not super flowery it's just this threat is in your face and then it moves yep. on it, which yeah. it's very bare bones i think i agree with not enough yeah like like if they if the yeah. author had described in loving detail how much of a threat this character was under, then it would just be no care. That would be but right. They no, th this definitely is not enough because part of having such short descriptors for everything mm -hmm. means there's no there's no lead in. Like you can't say, Oh, maybe I'm gonna need to skip this chapter. Maybe I'm gonna need to skip that paragraph. Like there's nothing that warns you you might need to skim or that something might be about to get rough mm -hmm. yeah that's true um, there's no there's no prep for you as a reader it just kind of happens right yeah so so not a, not enough yeah for the neurological damage this is a weird one because i think i would say that that when these books were written this would be counted as taking more care than it is today. Yeah. Only because neurological damage from technology that we are using is a lot more of a actual, not present danger, but it's a lot more of like a, a real possibility now. And like, we're not at the point with what we call virtual reality to be like neurologically plugged into a simulation like we're not doing that. We're still at like mm -hmm. the here wear a headset and just see things kind of a point. Like we're we're still at that step. But also when it comes to to things like well like, you know, kind of kind of mentioned like people who have concussions avoiding screens, avoiding technology mm -hmm. because it will exacerbate your condition. That's a very real modern thing. Mhm. Mm and not that computers and screens didn't exist when this book was written, but, like... I mean, just discourse around how our brains can be affected by... It's just everywhere. ...has advanced so yeah. much. It's been almost... It, it has been 20 years since this book came out. Yeah. So... Yeah. Like, even something as simple as we know about CTE now. <laughs> like... Yeah. Um, I think it's, uh chronic traumatic encephalopathy i think that's it i would have had to um i might have the wrong suffix on the last yeah. word it's either encephalopathy or encephalitis <laughs> something cte anyway it's it's the the thing that um classically in the u.s at least mm -hmm. uh american football players mm -hmm. get um mm -hmm. <laughs> getting hit in the head which which is not to be uh, fair and a um a technology related thing but even like our medical technology has advanced to the no. point where you know we we just know more about the damage that people go under neurologically from different things right just caring more about brain damage yeah just in general uh, we're more culturally aware of it so with all of that being said <coughs> what do you think for care because I don't, I don't feel like care was in mind. It just feels like he wasn't 
point of view character. Um, but he also did have a tiny spike of it. Is the thing spike of, of what? brain of neurological damage of a headache. Oh no no. Oh yeah. So no, I, for for care. I'm I know, saying but I'm that- I'm saying like even for care, yeah. like th- he had a tiny piece of this thing that was linked to the greater trauma, like as a oh yeah, you know, at least I'm not dealing with the a hundredfold of this thing, but like this is a real thing that mm-hmm. we have that we know how to handle. Like oh oh, you mean Matt versus Leaf? Like yeah, okay, Matt as the main character. Yeah, okay. Um, it. <laughs> either enough or not enough i don't i don't get the feeling with any of these that care was in mind i think like, you're just i think you're right it's not, it's not that kind no of book. it's it's a very bare bones very very short very very like um not not action-packed as in like constant combat or whatever but action-packed as in like the main character really at least like on screen quote-unquote in the book never really stops moving of like Plot points never really mm-hmm. stop happening. Plot never really pauses at any point. And 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 it's no so aftercare. short. There's no aftercare for really anything and and everything mm-hmm. everything from sentence structure to the actual length of the book is so ch- tiny and so short that like putting in care into these things, I mean Oh, it would slow it, it to a crawl. It would make it a totally It would text. double the would I almost feel like it would thriller. double the book. <laughs> It might not be quite yeah. that bad, but everything is so direct and so stark and so here's here are the things that you need to have gotten out of this exchange. Um now that being said, there are some very good like class conscious critiques in here mm-hmm. that are very nuanced. Yes. But but every word, even the nu- even the words in some very nuanced conversations are like precise, super precise wording because the character doesn't have time to say it twice. And, like, the main character understands their friend and understands the person they're talking to the first time because there's no room in this book for miscommunication. Which which really is, like, honestly, for me personally, like, I really love books that are super nuanced and maybe they're lying and the reader might not know even if the character does or the other way around or whatever. Like, I really like... I really like your, you know, your, your Robert Jordan who takes everything as a, as a political maneuver or whatever. Like, I really like a lot of books like that, but also a book like this where it's like, hey, you know what? I kind of want to read like a teen spy story (laughs) and I don't really care about the plot intrigue. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to just kind of watch it happen. Like, it's so direct. So all that to say, do you think not enough? Or enough. I I think I'm what the thing that I'm trying to weigh in my mind is if the directness and the bluntness and the here's your one le- sentence. This is what happened, and now we are past it, and you as a reader are not experiencing it for longer than it took you to read that sentence. I'm trying mm. to decide how mm-hmm. much that counterbalances the subject matter, because so you're trying to figure out if brevity is care in this well that's the thing is brevity is care a lot of times that that's actually part of the logic not not all of the logic part of part of the logic of this is also just giving people like a heads up but it's part of the reason that trigger warnings are effective because they're a single Uh word or phrase trigger warnings and content warnings on our on our podcast on our episodes part of the reason that they're even helpful mm-hmm. is because they're so short if you go further there will be more of this but it's but it's more if than you that go further, there will be more of this we say the minimum to convey exactly like there for in thing. in our even yeah. in our content warnings brevity is care and and i don't know it's it's just hard because like the of these three traumas, and- the one that resonated with me as a middle schooler the most would have been the the threat of physical harm. Because, like, the, the stunted emotional growth, that's tied so much into classism that, like, as an adult, I read it and go, oh, there's, like, seven layers here. But as a kid, that, that was not a oh, thing yeah. that was in my, like, wheelhouse. Like, I did not have experience with, with those people. So, so but at, when I was reading it, but even then, like, like a threat of physical harm is not really something that really is, like, it, it, it doesn't set off those, like, reading it 
doesn't harm me. So I'm I'm not really sure how to. So I would say that in in matters like this, when we cannot decide if it's not, we should care err on the care for the sake of the ratings. Yeah, err on the we side of it being not enough, being worse. Not enough. Individual readers might be fine. Yeah, like but yeah, we can't yeah. positively state that enough care was taken, and I think we should leave that rating there. Mm-hmm. For the point of view, everything is Matt. <laughs> Matt travels a lot, goes to a lot of places, but meets a lot of people, Matt is in a lot of different view. environments. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's all, all Matt. Matt. You know, something I would like to do, aspiring at some mm-hmm. point, I think would be cool if we get to. I would actually, when we get to our one year mark of episodes that have been published, I would like to go through and count or catalog how many traumas we have listed as each category. <laughs> Um, because I yeah. think that'd be fun to see what kind of things we're reading. Anyways, uh, yeah. aspiring post, writer tip. You cool said graphs. you had one. I have okay. one. I have one. Okay. All right. Listen. Either listen close or read carefully, depending on whether you're doing the transcript or the audio version, whichever. Okay. Yeah. Listen to me. Ooh. Words tend towards having two words next to each other then we use them a lot and then we add a hyphen and then eventually everybody gets tired and the hyphen goes away wait what if you you've lost me all this is a you've lost trend. me already on how this is relevant but that's okay 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 this is a this is a this bothered me so much reading this book i literally can't even think of what you're talking about in the book but continue <laughs> okay <laughs> Online is a hyphenated word in this book. Okay. Because it was a hyphenated word like in the twenty 90s. years ago. And yeah. if you are try right. So if, if you're you super are pedantic. Right. Something in the right. If you're <laughs> trying to write something in the future, a very simple way to make it feel like you're actually in the future is take some stuff that's hyphenated when you're writing and ditch the hyphen. So, because either you'll look like you're ahead of the trend, or you will anticipate where your reader is going to be in a decade when they pick up your book and it doesn't have a hyphen anymore. Oh my like, god! If you read like Alice in Wonderland and stuff, there's stuff that's separate phrases and some stuff that's hyphenated. And me reading now, a lot of the stuff that was two words, it's hyphenated now, and the stuff that was hyphenated is just one word all smushed together. I, I love watching for hyphens in books, and it just bugged me so much that a book set in the future didn't anticipate that we would say, like, they, they took the time to say, to spell V-E-R, V-E-E-Y-A-R, <laughs> but didn't drop the hyphen from online. And I'm like, you- This, this you really, ir- this really annoyed you. So the general- Wow. The general writing tip- it bothered me so much. The general writing general tip, writing tip you, is from me just try is, is okay. hyphens in in the English language. Hyphens tend <laughs> to go away over time because we want to write things more quickly. Like I currently have fights with my word processor where I'm like, "Hello, Microsoft. We don't have a hyphen in that anymore because it has been five years since you did this coding, uh, and that just doesn't have a hyphen anymore." I'm sorry. It's smushed together. It's it's one big word now. So that's a thing in English. And if you're writing books in English, and I, I can only speak for American English, but at least with this, hyphens go away. A really easy way to make your book set in the future really feel like it's in the future is to ditch hyphens and hyphenate some stuff that's a phrase where you can guess that maybe it's going to have a hyphen. But for sure, if it has a hyphen now and your book is more than 20 years in the future, this was 125 years in the future from when it was published. If it's if you're more than 20 years in the future, ditch some hyphens. That's that's my message. To this you. is this I is specifically a and Robin wants to read your book and enjoy it in 20 years message, I think. <laughs> <laughs> not just a yes. writing tip this is a robin doesn't want in 20 years to have a million digital like, books that they just can't the handle the quickest way for me, <laughs> the quickest way for me to get a mental sense of when a book was read, written is which things are hyphenated or not 
Like, that's a thing I passively and sometimes actively track when I'm reading. I'm like, oh, this must be this old because this thing is two separate words or this thing is still hyphenated. And then I check and I'm usually within a decade. So so when this book was... And then if it gets like super far old enough. Written 20 years ago, it could either have been 10 or 30? No, no, no. I, like, no. Okay. I... Sorry, when I say usually within a decade, I mean like, oh, I'm like, uh, is this the 1920s? Oh, oh, it was the 30s. I was wrong. Oh, or okay. It was the 10s. But like somewhere, like, just as a general, like, how many things are and are not hyphenated gives me as a reader a sense of how old something is. God. And if you have never thought about hyphens before, and I... Oh, I've totally thought about hyphens before. A, I've actually intentionally a, thought about well, this very saying, thing and ditched hyphens when I'm typing online sometimes for the same reasons, because it's yeah, faster. So, but also, it will never bother me in a book, ever. So I it, just it, will it never went, care. The only reason it bothered me is because this was trying to be in the future, and so it was claiming to be in the future, but everything in the writing screamed that it was that it was older that it was in my past yeah but like things like that things like that i tend to chalk up to just the future isn't the way that you imagine it oh yeah and so like that again that will never that will never bother me because okay they they were wrong there's some (laughs) stuff you're gonna get wrong but but if you're writing a thing and it's in the future and you'd like to do that just that little bit to help it not feel dated Ditch some hyphens. That's that's it. That's my tip. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have full dis- full disclosure? Robin did not enjoy this book. Robin, do you do you have a book. favorite and n- favorite non traumatic thing? I at all. Uh, the most charmingly annoying thing. Oh lord, that is not traumatic. Uh is that uh, the amount of very specific phrases from the 1990s that are used and are called out as being from over a hundred years ago, (laughs) specifically in the text. (laughs) And it's not that they know them. And the main character is like, oh, I know that one because I have read the book of slang from a hundred years ago. Like, that's almost exactly what <laughs> yeah. it says. Um, and the thing is, like, I know the phrase the bee's knees. It's from, like, the 20s and it was part of, like, bee's knees, cat's pajamas. There was a whole bunch of phrases based on, like, things with animals. But the reason I know that phrase is because the bee's knees made it to now. Like, it actually stuck around. Yeah, we still make bees and knees jokes me with saying the bee this, memes. Right. Exactly. Like, and me saying this might be how some of you find out that it is from the 1920s <laughs> in the US. <laughs> yeah. Like, because it actually made it. And so we have this, like, split where where the girls in the clique probably are engaging with these phrases in that way. Mm. And then you have this main character explaining, ah, I know what they are talking about. I know the smart, cool kid lingo because I read a book of lingo from a hundred years ago. And that's how I know what the cool kids are saying now. I mean, isn't that how everyone gets in with... <laughs> no, just kidding. When, when, when it's not in his character that he's specifically a linguist or super interested in language, like if he were a language nerd, I'd be like, okay, cool. That's How fine. do you know that but he when isn't? he's not, it was like, if that's the way they tried to communicate that he's a I don't actually nerd, remember. I needed more. There isn't, yeah. Robin, if, there if isn't room in this book for more. To... <sighs> There's no space. Anyway, however, with the with the way that it was in this book, uh, it was charmingly frustrating <laughs> and non-traumatic. And I just, and also, like, our sibling's name is Heather, for so for it to be that movie where they reference Tethers, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> hey. I mean, that's, that, that does not I sound have, like a writer problem. That sounds like a you problem. Because it yeah, is our sibling. Well, this isn't the, this isn't the problem section. This is the, oh, okay. the favorite non-dramatic thing. That's and true. that's mine, is that the, like, just this little bit of having what clearly seemed to be an interest in the it be an example in the book of a freeze having made it to 125 years in the future mm-hmm. and then to have someone not just let it sit 
but to call it out as being over a hundred years old. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I know it is because we don't use that anymore. Yeah. Anyway, that's mine. Uh, you love this. I do. Book. I like this you series. Wanted to read this one. What is your favorite non-traumatic thing? About it's actually it? something I know you disliked, which is great. That's fine. I really like <laughs> the uh the ver- the image descriptions of how VR looks and feels. Um, it's just super mm-hmm. tactile, and it makes sense, and it's streamlined, mm-hmm. and I like it. And I also like mm-hmm. that in literally book one of the series. There's some like highlighted problems and dangers. Like it's not a, it's not a technology is magic and it works perfectly all the time and everything is okay kind of a series, which I appreciate mm-hmm. because it would have been easy to do. It that would have been very time. easy to do that. And there's a lot of books that I've read that do do that. And part of the thing that makes the tech in those books not as interesting to me is because they do that. And so like it feels less real. But this book starts out, Mm -hmm. the series, I should say, starts out with technology advances feeling very logical and real, along with bugs and issues. (laughs) (laughs) Also, I just, I don't know. I just really like, I like the, uh, the, the descriptions of how people utilize programs and the different, like, interfaces that they have for different programs and the fact that because it's all virtual, interfaces are programmable. So, like, there's one point, this is not really a spoiler, um, there's one point where a character has a program that the interface is like a virtual race car, but you he can use this program for different things. And so like, he just knows what all of the race car dials and knobs and readouts mean. But like that program could have looked like anything. There's another program that looks like a magnifying glass and you pick it up and look through it and mm-hmm. like, you know. It and and it runs the program, and I just I really like that. I'm a tactile sensory person. I like that. It makes it feel interesting and also like something that I would I I don't know I would love to go online like that. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, yeah. It's not like a super unique take on virtual reality. I just like that it it has a very logical um, setup to it. So I think that's it thank you so much for joining us and we'll catch you in a fortnight all music used in this podcast was created by nicole as heartbeat art co and is used with permission you can follow us on twitter at books that burn all one word you can email us with questions comments or book recommendations at books that burn at yahoo.com support us on patreon.com slash books that burn all patrons get access to our upcoming book list and receive a one-time shout out you can leave us an itunes review this helps people to find the show and find us on itunes stitcher google play or wherever you get your podcasts thanks for listening we'll be back in two weeks